Yep. Right now, we're talking <laughs> about closing the loop and uh, reading the codes. Now, this is this is some stuff I threw together, and I'd already done this uh, over at the other campus. Close the loop happens when fuel is injected, combustion happens, O2 sensor reports to the PCM, PCM modifies fuel delivery, O2 sensor reports again, PCM modifies fuel delivery again, and your O2 sensor reports again. So you basically got a, a, a repeat. This is what's happening. Anytime you got a closed loop system, like for example, this wristwatch tells me what time it is, but it's not a closed loop system because it doesn't know if it's right or wrong. It's got no weight. That thermostat on the wall is a closed loop system because it's measuring the temperature and it can operate the air conditioner to, to fix mm -hmm. things. You see what I'm saying? That's what a closed loop system is. Okay. On a lot of these vehicles, this right here, this EGR system here, is a closed loop system because it's actually checking what it's doing and changing what changing its strategy as it goes. Right? And so basically there's a lot of closed loop systems, but the one that is the most pertinent to what we're talking about is the uh, closed loop system in, re in regard to fuel trim and the oxygen sensor and all that kind of thing. Um, when I went to General Motors School uh, under Ellen Smith in 1981, it was a little two-day class, uh, she was talking about closed loop. That's the first time I'd ever heard of it. And she described it in a way that just made perfect sense. And after six, seven years later in the field, I was talking to mechanics that were really good mechanics that didn't understand closed loop. They didn't understand it. You know, I mean, and, I, and so, but she explained it so well that I understood it, and I had to explain it to a lot of other people. It's not that complicated, really. Another closed loop is when the engine starts, the PCM reads idle speed from the crank sensor. In other words, the crank sensor is basically, you know, whirling past that thing, it's getting speed. It adjusts the IEC or the throttle plate, PCM reads RPM again, readjusts the IEC or the throttle plate, and it reads RPMs again. That's kind of like when you turn up your radio, you know when you got it too loud, you turn it back down, right? Mm -hmm. That's a closed loop. It's basically what it is. And uh, whenever you touch something and it's hot and you pull your hand back, that's a closed loop too. Uh, one of the funny things I ever heard was that you can take really warm water, not hot water, just warm water and really cold water and have these two copper tubes that are entwined around one another so that they feel like just one tube. Mm -hmm. And if you run cool water through one and warm water through the other, when you touch it, your brain will tell you that's hot and it's going to burn your hand. <laughs> And you'll jerk your hand back. It tricks you out, you know. But that's a little closed loop thing. Now, the oxygen sensor, these two wires typically right here will be the same color. This is your heater right here. Anytime you see a symbol like that on a schematic, that's a heater. If you, if you see a cigarette lighter or if you see the, the little um, rear window defroster grid, it's going to be a, like this right here. Oxygen sensor, you know, you got your low and your high. There's a comparator and a CPU in there. And basically what it's trying to do is it's just trying to keep track of what this is. There's a lot of engineering that goes into this system to begin with. There's your oxygen sensor. Everybody's seen one of those. There's your PCM. And typically the ignition will have a fuse right there uh, on that. Okay. So uh, even though the rear O2 sensor is a catalyst efficiency monitor input, it can still drive fuel trim. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, and I, I learned it when I went to a CarQuest Technical Institute training program that was over there. We had a one night class over there at uh, Enterprise, and uh, I went over there to that thing. And these guys had actually played around with the uh, oxygen sensor with the oxygen sensor input voltage. You know, they actually dialed around with it, watched what the fuel trims were doing, and all. If it can't trust the one in front of the catalytic converter and it knows it can't trust it, and it will start using the one behind it so that it won't destroy the catalyst. Because its whole purpose and plan with all this closed loop is to keep the catalytic converter happy mm -hmm. and to keep everything in the now. If it's burning as clean as it can, you know, with your 14.7. Mm -hmm. Now, you, ever, you know that little thing that looks like a walking symbol? It's a, a Greek letter lambda that I drew on the board the other yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. That's, you know, 1.0 is when you're at 14.7 to 1. I mean, that's what yeah, everything is. Just like it's idea. supposed to be with Lambda is at 1.0. You're going to see that on some of your newer scans. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, the up, upstream sensor <coughs> is going to be switching like that. The downstream sensor, it won't look exactly like that, but the downstream sensor is supposed to be lazy. It's supposed to be moving real slow and forcing around there. <laughs> if it sees it look like this, then it's going to pass. There's the front one, there's the back one. I wrote an article for Motor Age called Herding Cats. 
where I talked a little bit more about this. If you look up mine, the downstream is a straight line. Yeah, it's not bad. I mean, if you're as long as it's not a bunch it's, of it's pretty much if it's well, does it ever move at all? No. Okay, well then that may be a you may have a, something going on with your with that circuit or something like that. But I mean, if it's a if there is a I mean, it can be fooled if that one down there is you know just dragging along. But if you gas it a couple of times, this one should react, but not as strongly as that one does. You know, I've got some videos of that going on. If the downstream sensor is really coming close to mirror in the upstream, that's an epic fail. It's mm -hmm. going to give you a PO420 or a PO, you know, 430 or whatever, and that's going to tell you. And furthermore, if you ever get a PO4 series code and you're thinking the catalytic converter is what's going on, and most of the, most of the time it will be. Sometimes the catalytic converter is going to be cleaned out, burned out because this stuff is going on. But the long and the short of it is. Um, Always make sure that you're paying attention to the cat that's between the two sensors because there will be another cat farther back that ain't got no sensors monitoring it. Mm -hmm. And on a Mazda one time that I worked on over there that came in with a PO420 code, I basically went in there and told them to order me a catalytic converter and the parts department ordered the wrong one. And whenever that, I was wrapped up with drivability work so they gave it to another mechanic and he just, the catalytic converter they put on there was the back one and he just popped that one in there and put it out without even, you know, doing anything. And they came back, hey, I still got the same code. Well, he changed the wrong cat. You know, basically, you got to change the one that's between the two sensors. That's the only one that it can check. Now, oxygen sensor voltage, let me go on like this. See, whatever, if you notice the short fuel trim is, a lot of times you're going to see it do that. See, uh, while it's going up, 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 this is going down, down, down. All right. When this gets to a certain place, that's going to start going down because it's actually has subtracted fuel. This is happening really fast. It's going back and forth pretty quick. All right. Then when you got a lean exhaust, it keeps going up, 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 up until every until it gets it to go up again. And when it peaks out, it starts going down again. That's when you get this sawtooth. Now I will tell you what will happen sometimes on your dodges. On your dodges, because of the way theirs are set up, and I don't know if the newer ones are doing this, but I've seen them do it years ago, even back in the early 90s. That oxygen sensor would go crap out and it would hang right above six tenths of a volt. And it was still in closed loop. And the engine controller would start making this sawtooth crap trying to get that to straighten out. And it would buck and jump and buck and jump mm -hmm. and just drive you up the wall thinking something terrible was going on. And I actually found out that was on the, one of the president of college had a 91 Dodge pickup. And I felt it doing that. I had a scan tool with me. And I said, well, I've seen this before on Jeeps and stuff. And so on that particular one, he had a, <laughs> the oxygen sensor had a lead on it about that long. You know, and I knew what it was going to have in the house. So I cut the lead and I grounded the signal wire that was going into the sensor so that it wouldn't have floating voltage and cause issues. And it ran just fine after that until I got another sensor put on it. <laughs> um, but the long and the short of it is that's what your fuel that your short fuel trim is going to look like. Now, as I say, if it has, if it keeps like if it's trying to compensate one way or another, and it cannot see, there's your percentages, and it it can go farther than that. It can go up into the 30s on some vehicles. Uh, but it, basically, you're wanting this short fuel trim to float near zero all the time. It's got to be going above and below zero, two or three percent, not a whole lot. If I'm seeing it get past double digits, I'm worried about it. I'm going to try to find out what's going on with it. Um, the crazy thing about something like a mass airflow sensor is the mass airflow sensor can be just slightly out of kilter, not very much like if you're measuring voltage and you're seeing 0 0.81, 810 millivolts uh, on one that's more, I actually used to, on that Ranger out here, I had a, a mass airflow sensor that fits that Ranger that will read uh, the one that was a healthy fuel trim and all was reading 810 millivolts and I could put a one on there that was reading 790 millivolts that ain't much, and it would drive those fuel trims crazy because it wasn't telling the truth. You see what I'm saying? And that throws the fuel trim out of kilter. The fuel trim's all about keeping it balanced is what it's about. HO2S11, closest to the engine on bank one. HO2S12 is behind the catalyst on bank one. All right. HO2S21 is closest to the engine on bank two, and 2.2 is behind the catalyst. Now make sure you're working on a proper sensor. Don't get confused. Find cylinder number one. You find a cylinder number one, you found bank one. Bank one is where sensor one will be. 
is different for Fords and Dodges and Chevys and a sideways V6. You better make darn sure you know which one's bank one. And the way you determine bank one, if you're into the uh, engine design thing, the cylinder that's the farther is forward on the crankshaft is always cylinder number one. And it's the, and it's the driver's side bank on a Ford, passenger side bank on a Chevy. See what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. bank cylinder one one on a Chevy will be on the opposite side of the vehicle than it'll be on a Ford. So make sure you're aware of that. Don't get caught up. When these first came out in 1994 on Thunderbirds, I was confused about which one was which, and I had one with a throw me a code, and I worked on the wrong sensor for three quarters of an hour before I figured out what the sound mill was going on. You know, because I was trying to, I was figuring one one and one two for the two front ones. Mm -hmm. And two one and two two are the ones behind the cap, but that ain't the way it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see the so the the one slash two they're talking about the bank. Now your half cycle, uh, you know this would like to be a pass and a fail. If this thing right here is not making it as high or as low as it should be, you see what I'm saying? You're going to have issues with that, and that's when it's going to start throwing you for a loop there. See how this one here? It's actually counting how many times it switches back and forth above and below these lean and rich switch points. You can see how if the sensor gets a little bit lazy and it never makes it to the lean and rich switch points the PCM is looking for, and you know, you may not never know it. Did I, which one of y'all was I was showing that mode six data? Uh, on that, uh, that little, um, was it a Toyota? Yeah, I think so. Now, you know, you got this little blue ELM327 you can go into that mode 6 data and you can see early on what's starting to fall out of line. Like on my Explorer when I go in there, it'll tell me that the EGR is beginning to develop a problem, but it hasn't even thrown a code, doesn't even have any uh, impending codes, but it, that's the next thing I'm going to see. When I see something, I'm going to have EGR flow issues. And so, you know, you, you know, there's other things that it reads too, a whole lot of stuff. You just got to know how to you know, interpolate those things. All right, now this one right here, if you have, sometimes you'll actually have a code that will tell you that, it, that one, one oxygen sensor or the other is switching too slowly. See, if it's sluggish, and I've seen sluggish oxygen sensors cause drivability issues and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, it, it took too long. See, like if it's supposed to be going like this, you might notice when it's idling, this, these humps are going to be, you know, sort of spread out a little bit. When you bring it up to about 12, 1500 RPM and hold it there, uh, it's going to be switching really fast. One day I had this boy in here, uh, Casey, and uh, that, you know that sable out there? Mm -hmm. uh, I had it pulled up over where that Crown Victoria is sitting right now. And we were going to look at some of the stuff that was going on. I actually had the uh, wireless vehicle interface so we could all see it on the computer screen. And I says, Casey, get in the sable. And, Bring it up to 1500 and let's see what the, watch this oxygen sensor because I was going to, you know, do some stuff to make it change and all that. Well, and to him, or he wasn't used to it or something, bring it up to 1500 means go all the way to the floor and then come back to 1500 oh, just briefly. So the uh, gas pedal got hung under the floor mat and the darn old thing threw two rods right there in the service bay. Sound like a bomb going off. What? And the guy that was standing in front of it was a guy named Frank that was a Desert Storm veteran, and he had shell shock a little bit anyway, and he almost jumped over the bench. Oh my and gosh. he was like 51 years old. And so uh, we were going to use the smoke machine, you know, we had that air hose plugged into the smoke machine and all. And Frank was already kind of jittery, and I said, all right, I guess we're through with this one for right now, you know. I said, uh, <laughs> go ahead and take the air hose loose from the smoke machine, let's roll it back over. <laughs> and when he took the air hose loose, he went, yeah, you know, he was already jumping because of that, you know, thing popping off. I had never seen him jump like that before, but that was a loud noise. It shook the wheel windows around here. Uh, we, I just had him take a, another motor I had over here and tear it down and build it up with junk parts. And that's what's in it now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my and it runs pretty good. Really. Yeah. All right, on your heated thermal top oxygen sensor, I got this from, uh, you know, oh, I just pulled it online because it's a good one in these. Uh, AAA1car.com people have got some good diagram. The heater should have enough current going to it to burn a stop lamp fuse, I mean a uh, uh, stop lamp bulb. The element has about six ohms of resistance and it's kind of like a glow plug. You ever seen a glow plug? You know what a glow plug looks like? That's a glow plug. That's a glow plug out of a power stroke diesel. And you put a ground here and you put power there, that darn thing gets red hot really, really fast. Now this one here, 
doesn't get as hot as this does because this thing gets just blistering hot within a few seconds. That right there will bring this sensor up to its 600 degrees that it needs to work really fast. Back in the day, they just let the heat of the exhaust heat this thing up and the ground that was provided through the threads back then, back when they first started putting oxygen sensors on there. The first people that used an oxygen sensor that I know about, I think, was Volvo in 1975. They called it a Lambda sensor. <laughs> and um, and uh, on these uh, Chryslers, it just had a one-wire oxygen sensor on them. I was working on one, and it was running rich. And I remember the lady at the General Motors School that was the teacher over there. Uh, she says, if you take your... Uh, Unplug the oxygen sensor if you feel like it's causing the problem because it's reading lean and it ought to be. Unplug the oxygen sensor and, you know, fix it so you can actually get your finger touching something that's going into the harness on the other and uh, just uh, touch the battery, positive battery current. And it will actually bump the voltage up in that uh, thing to where it'll cause it to clear up. If that causes it to clear up, you got a dead oxygen sensor. And I did that and fixed some cars that way. You know, you're actually using the voltage coming through your body because you're measuring, it'll measure you. It'll measure what's coming through you because it's that sensitive, you know, like it's like a digital whole voltmeter. All right, so here's your heater lead. Now, this is not showing the leads that are giving you your oxygen sensor switch and signal. This is just the heater. Both these wires will typically be the same color, and you're typically going to have about six ohms from one to the other, and that's what that little heater element looks like in there. And you might notice this heater contact, you know, is going around that little gold-plated thing right there. All right, so there's no temperature sensor in these heaters. The PCM monitors heater resistance to maintain the heater temperatures. You know, Ohm's law works here too. General Motors calls this resistance calculated oxygen sensor heater temperature, RCOHT. Doesn't spell a word, so you can't say that's an acronym, right? The heater circuit has a calibration resistor built into the wire harness for, or you know, uh, or sensor connector. So and that's just a little bit of a something there. Now when EGR is flowing, O2 sensor voltage rises, indicating less oxygen. And so basically, whenever your EGR is on, it's going to go up. Now General Motors for a long time used that to determine if oxygen if EGR was flowing. It would check to see if EGR was flowing by watching the oxygen sensor when it commanded the EGR. See, that's a closed loop. See, it's actually saying, well, I'm going to turn this on and we'll see if that works. When you were running your old self-test on the forge years ago, it would actually put uh, upstream air from the air injection reactor in there, or the AIR system, you know, and it would put it upstream to see if the oxygen sensor would say that would, would go lean while it was dumping air upstream, and that's how I knew if that was working. If it wasn't, it'd throw you an old code 44 on those two code cars. All right, so the EGR is off, you know, it starts, you know, it goes back into the regular flow loop. Back in the day, uh, some of the early 90s Ford pickups used to have a strategy they call lean cruise mode. And I think they were trying to help them get better gas mileage or something. I don't know what the deal was. But occasionally, when it was in lean cruise mode, it would do something. It would jump out of lean cruise mode and operate the EGR to make sure everything was still working right. I mean, it was a strange strategy they used and all that. And if you were just coming out over a hill and you were letting off the gas when it did that, it would literally feel like another car had run into the back of the truck. Boom! It would do that. And so I recorded that going on. And uh, after the people in another Ford dealership had replaced everything except the hood of the truck trying to make it quit doing that, I made a recording of it using the portable vehicle analyzer that we have at SBDS and sent it to Ford. And the, the, the guy called me back. It was on dial-up, too. This was a while ago, you know. So the guy called me back. He says, you'll never fix that. He said, that's designed into the truck. And he says, there's not enough people complaining about it for us to do anything about it. So it is what it is. You know? So anyway, I thought that was very interesting. A lot of the times, you know, you'll find them doing stuff like that. Now you got a bunch of different kinds of oxygen sensors, thermal, planar, wide band. You can see your electrode modules about these sensors. This one here's got the pump cell. You know, you fooled with the electrode modules talking about those. Those electrode modules go deeper into that than any other training I've ever seen. So that's some of the best stuff you'll ever get. Those people in Holland really know how to put some stuff together, you know. All right. Now this right here is your, uh, come on in here, hot shot. Uh, your standard corporate protocol data bus. And there's the other inside of the data bus, 2 and 10, you know. Now it's not going to be exactly like this on every one of these connectors. The one common denominator that you're going to see on all of these connectors here 
is you're going to see power at 16 and you're going to see ground at 4 and 5. You will always see power at 16 and ground at 4 and 5. If your scan tool won't power up and you can't see anything, then what you're going to be looking at is you're going to be looking at a fuse, usually the fuse for the cigarette lighter. You know, you've got to be able to find out what fuse it is. You can give him a sheet too. Because he's supposed to know all this stuff. All right. Now, you might notice on this one wire bus here coming off, this is like on a forge, basically. When you hear SCP and ISO 9141, that's going to be a forge. There's your gem module. That also tells you it's a forge. ABS, airbag modules on that. Sometimes the ABS will be on this one, depending on the year model. Uh, but anyway, and there's your EEPROM power. Uh, what EEPROM power is, what, anybody know what EEPROM stands for? Electronic ignition something. <laughs> Electronic erasable. If, okay. you're, if you're reflashing the engine controller, 18 volts goes into that engine controller and wipes out the programming in the engine controller, and then it rewraps that data. And it doesn't really take that long to do because it's, the data is not that... You know, it's not like, uh, you know, Microsoft Windows or something like that, <laughs> you know. I had these Windows 98 machines in here years ago, and I would put all the stuff on these all data disks into these folders, and I would go go to these folders, I'd go uh, select all, delete, yes to all, yes to all, yes to all, and then I would put the other files in there. And in one of these machines, the one that was sitting right over there back in the day, I accidentally opened Windows folder and did that. Selected all the folders, delete, yes to all, yes to all, yes to oh, all. Nice. And did you know what it did? It only erased the stuff it didn't need to run Windows, and that machine ran smoother than any other machine in the place. <laughs> <laughs> it was smart as a whip. You know, you never would have thought it would have done that. It did not ruin the operating system. They had it blank blocked where it couldn't do that. I thought that was pretty cool. All right. How can you determine which wires feed the heater on an O2 sensor? Black and gray? No. I told you all just a few minutes ago, if you were paying attention, you'd know. This is to see how well you were listening to what I said. I don't talk there, son. Please. You've, I've told you this 756,200. And you too, GL. I know the gray one. Huh? I ain't a gray one. No. Mm -hmm. There's only three wires going to it, right? Four. Four. Oh. Only, only one I'm talking about. Okay, that's it. He's already let's missed the first question. All right. What happens to the O2 signal when a cylinder begins to misfire? It a broken. No. It a crack gets towards lean or there's it a go lean or go. All I'm wanting to know is which way it's going to go. Oh yeah. Okay. It's going to be. You put that starter on in record time, didn't you? I see that you do the transmission in record time. You got to finish your alignment first. I, I already did that. I got to pull it right here. You got to pull it around there, and we got to probably do some brake work on it. Yeah. All right. What happens to the O2 signal when EGR begins to flow? If you were listening, of course, I think you may have missed that part of it. Let me start running. These guys over here are just scribbling their answers left and right because they were in here. What happens to the O2 signal when a fuel injector wire breaks while driving? Let's say you're driving down the road and there's a rat crawling around under there and he bites the injector wire in two. And that injector goes dark. Write it down if that's what you think the answer is. Hey, young lady. Are you Richard? I am Richard. My husband Jason from Edison Alpha Person and we're going to talk to you. He just dropped off some parts. something done, because she's a student here anyway. All right. If the O2 signal hangs at 0.8 volts due to a sensor malfunction, what does the short fuel trim do? Short fuel trim? Yeah. 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 Ye
If the O2 signal hangs at 0.8 volts due to a sensor malfunction, what does the short fill trim do? What if this was your final exam? Probably fill it. Um, Both engines on fire going down into the trees. Yep. If the oil filler cap is removed from the engine running, the fuel trim readings change. Why does this happen? Pardon, pardon me? All I want you to do is have a critical thinking mindset about this. I've actually demonstrated this in the shop. Oh, why does this happen? Oh. If the map or map sensor fails so that the PCM believes the vehicle is at high altitude, <laughs> which way does the fuel trim go? And why does it do this? This is how you learn some of the stuff you need to know, right? Yeah. Which of these two traces is the downstream O2 sensor? The blue or the red? Downstream? Should be blue. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Are you doing the make it up as you go thing? Yep. This is a Ford exhaust system. Which of these sensors is HO2S12? Uh, is one left or right? That's a good one. Is one left or right? That part of the deal is you're supposed to know this. I think it's the left side. Yeah. And it's going to be... Try driver or passenger when you're talking about it. Okay, passenger. No, it's going to be on cylinder number one, right? Well, bank one and cylinder one are always on the same side. Alright, I know what it is. This is a Chevy exhaust system. Which of these sensors is HO2S12? Fuel contaminated engine oil happens when a vehicle goes too long between oil changes. What does this do to the fuel trim? To the long fuel trim? Uh, might get run. What does closed loop mean? Can I give you an example? Five words or less. Can I give you an example? If you want to. Not out loud though. What are the two most common open loop modes? Hey, there it is. You remember that, don't you? Yeah. What does it mean when the downstream O2 sensor is switching at or near the same rate as the upstream sensor? Fails. Uh, I think what that part we call. Which of the above, left or right, shows good catalytic converters? Mm, is it? Okay. The rear O2 sensor behind the cat can affect fuel trim, true or false? It's not screwed in all the way. Or has a leak. What's the typical resistance for the O2 sensor heater? 0.5. Oh, the heater? The heater. You're not going to measure the sensor itself, just the heater. Uh, what does this DTC mean? Mm, 
how does the PCM maintain heater temperature? What's the feedback method? And finally, 